Hello, everyone. I'm Vic Gotham. I will be the facilitator today. And welcome to A Biosciences webinar hosted by Chris Kong, our head of bioinformatics. Uh, the title of this webinar is Untangling Inflammatory Heterogeneity in Chronic Rhinosinitis with Single Cell RNA. The duration of this webinar is expected to be about 45 minutes, and then we'll open up for Q&A. Feel free to type in your questions uh, at any time in the chat box. All questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. Uh, with that, I will um, hand it off to Chris uh, to start his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Vic. So uh, welcome our audience. And uh, today we are going to present this uh, study that we have done with our customers. So it is a co-authored work uh, that we published with our uh, one of our collaborators last year in 2022. And the paper is published on nature immunology. So uh, if uh, anyone of the audience is interested in the contents of the paper, you can uh, ask us for the a PDF file or you can search it online. So uh, with that, I will start the webinar. In this webinar, we will give an example of applying single cell RNA-seq technology to investigate the immune biology of chronic rhinosinusitis. And uh, during the process, you will get to know some advanced experiment and analysis techniques for single cell data. And uh, uh, to make it uh, more valuable, this uh, whole process can be actually, can be uh, digested as a general design for microenvironment studies in the context of human disease. So now we move on to the contents. To provide some basic background, the disease we're studying, the chronic rhinosinusitis, is actually quite common. So, uh, an acute sinusitis is a very common condition that uh, you get from temporary like infection or allergy. So you will experience runny nose, congested nose, sometimes reduced sense of smell and taste. A lot of people get that after COVID or after some flu. And you will have headache, ear pain, all because of the inflammation in the sinus and in the uh, mucosa of your uh, tissues. So sometimes uh, the our lining of our uh, sinusitis uh, of our sinus is constantly maintained. So sometimes when it's damaged by some uh, trauma or chemicals or pathogens or inflammation, it there happens a process called EMT, and the damaged lining of the mucosa will replace itself. So there's certain types of cells, which I will introduce later, that uh, migrates there and uh, uh, duplicates and repairs the epithelium. And uh, together, different uh, cell compositions will restore the lining of mucosa to back to its original state where it's intact and it can protect us from the chemicals and pathogens. But sometimes when the lining is damaged beyond repair, or the inflammation persists, uh, the lining, the epithelium become in a different uh, state. So we will say it's a shifted local equilibrium. So the epithelium cannot repair itself or when it repairs itself, it results in persist inflammation and uh, uh, the mucosa is not intact and it cannot protect us from chemicals or pathogen. So, Chronic uh, rhinosinusitis happens when the rhinosinusitis lasts for at least 12 weeks. And it's very common that it occurs in 1% to 5% of the whole US population. And uh, the process, although it's under quite intense study, there are many things unknown. So during these years of uh, clinical practice, practice uh, scientists have classify this disease into different subtypes. So there's uh, CRS, SMP, meaning the chronic rhinosinusitis without nasal polyps. 
and there is CRS with nasal polyps. Nasal polyps is a very nasty growth in the nasal tract. And uh, furthermore, it can be divided into eosinophilic and uh, non-eosinophilic. So eosinophils are a type of disease-fighting white blood cell here. Uh, so in this type of CRS, the doctors have found out that uh, they are characterized by very high infiltration of these eosinophils. But why they're there and how it's damaging the local uh, microenvironment or how it's uh, causing the these symptoms is something that's under intense study, but uh, we don't have a very clear answer to it. If we have a very clear answer to it, there will be ways to combat this uh, syndrome, and then we can restore the CRS back to normal state. So these are some background on uh, CRS. And uh, also we need to know another background that is the three major types of innate and adaptive cell mediated the effect of immunity. So to make it simple, there are three types of immunity and they are uh, triggered under different uh, situations or triggered by different stimuli. There's type one immunity. The main stimuli will be the intracellular bacteria and uh, viruses. So for some pathogen that gets inside the cells. And the main players in this type of immunity are T helper one cell and cytotoxic T cell one, which namely TC1 and TH1 here. Another type is type two immunity. And it's, uh, it, uh, it's uh, always uh, triggered by the stimulus from outside, sometimes allergy, sometimes asthma. So asthma is uh, a manipulation or uh, uh, exposition of this type of immunity. And the main player in this type of immunity is T helper cell two and cytotoxic T cell two, TC2 and TH2 here, and there's type three against bacteria and fungi. But in the context of uh, the chronic uh, inflammation in the airway, type two immunity is studied the best. So uh, we give more introduction here. So uh, the type two immunity process in the chronic airway inflammation is very well studied. So uh, there are known to have different cells in play. For example, in the, uh, innate lymphoid cell two, TH2, and the eosinophils. But uh, its manifestations in the CRS still lack a lot of insight because we haven't get so deep into the microenvironment. And also, uh, although type two immunity is best studied in CRS, uh, there are also emerging evidence suggesting it's activation, the activation of type one immunity in CRS. So uh, it is something also under intense study, but uh, not a very good insight or theory has come up. So that gives the background of this study we have done. Uh, we actually, our study goal is to understand what's happening in this microenvironment and uh, what are some therapeutic targets that we can uh, combat against and then try to cure the disease. Or if not cure it, we try to uh, make it better. So the question becomes, why do we need single cell RNA-seq technique? In this single cell RNA-seq technique, it allows us to dissociate the solid tissue into a cell suspension. And sometimes for liquid tissue, for example, blood, we can sequence the content of every individual cell. Then we will know the identity of those cells, the subtypes that are previously. So how did the people define cell subtypes? Previously, we define cell types using a microscope. And sometimes we take the cells out and culture them. But uh, when it's in the case of real disease, the microenvironment is very complex as I'm showing here. So uh, a powerful way to know what's happening there and how the cells are modeling each other and uh, changing uh, in population is through single cell RNA-seq.
And the more than single cell RNA seq, we can actually profile a lot of things uh, together with the RNA. For example, the T cell receptor sequence and the protein on the cell surface and sometimes chromatin accessibility. So by getting this data, we can uh, not only know the cell subtype composition, we will know the tissue composition. For example, in different tissue, in the blood, in the inflamed tissue, in the normal tissue, how the composition of cell change. And we will identify markers and targets, and we can identify how the cell phase are changing and how the cells are interacting with each other. So that is the main technique we use in this study. In this study, we actually collected the different uh, samples from real patients. So for your eosinophilic uh, CRS, we collected five samples. And uh, from non eosinophilic uh, CRS, we collected five samples. And uh, uh, six samples for the CRS without nasal polyps. And we also collected the five healthy control to offer a baseline. The process is we take the solid tissue and dissociate into single cell suspension and then sequence the RNA content and uh, prepare them for analysis. The analysis pipeline is listed on the right side. After quality control, the data set comprised of more than 100,000 cells. Uh, each cell has uh, more than 28,000 genes. So that's a very profound description of the cell's transcriptome what genes they're expressing and what kind of behavior we can infer from the gene expression. The first part of the result is the composition of nasal mucosa at a single cell resolution. So through the uh, analysis pipeline we built here, we first take the RNA and quantify them for each cell and we quality check the cells. And then we remove the cells that are not valid or uh, not viable, and we do dimensionality reduction, adjust for the batch effects that rise from technical factors, and then we perform clustering. During clustering, we apply knowledge and also the published uh, reference data to get very precise description of the cell identity, of the subtypes identity. And then we can further perform the advanced analysis like trajectory, and uh, uh, cell interaction and identify rare cell types. So after quality control, we profiled more than 74,000 immune cells and more than 46,000 non-immune cells. And there are also uh, more than 1,000 uh, duplicating cells, which are the cells that are duplicating themselves. So the transcriptome inside are like largely taken by the genes that are in charge of uh, RNA production, DNA production, and protein production. Uh, and whereas the uh, genes for their like daily function uh, is lower. So we can, uh, we, it's harder for us to decide their identity, but it's a fairly small group among the whole population. Uh, based on this, we further classified the landscape into 73 cell subtypes into eight major groups. And the major groups can also be classified here. We have lymphocytes, myeloid cells, epithelial cells, endothelial cells, fibroblasts, and SMC. So the latter three are considered the stromal, and the first two are immune cells that's infiltrating into the tissue. So since we have different grouping of the samples namely healthy control, different disease groups, three disease groups in this setting, uh, we can actually compare the composition of cells under different situations. So uh, some findings are the epithelial cells were predominantly found in healthy controls. That means uh, for the disease samples, we detect more immune cells. And that's suggesting that uh, the immune cells are infiltrating into the tissue, causing inflammation, which is in line with our with the description of the disease. So uh, our single cell finding confirms the shift in microenvironment under chronic inflammation. This is a good finding in the first place. So next, we looked at those cells in further detail on the different groups. So there are eight groups here. Uh, we 
looked at the composition of different groups in different settings. So the first finding is we identified the impaired barrier function and basal cell differentiation in CRS. So from the uh, 28,000 epithelial cells, we classified them into uh, seven types, including two rare cell types that are usually reported to exist in the microenvironment, but they're usually not detected in other studies. So this confirms that uh, our experiment technique is quite precise and uh, very good at preserving the cells that we can detect those cells that are not typically observed. And if everybody looks at this uh, plot here, we can see the microenvironment is quite complex, comprised of different cells, even if we don't consider the immune cells that's infiltrating, the stromal composition is quite complex. So, uh, and different cells are also expressing a quite unique uh, functions and uh, uh, markers. So, uh, we then moved on into investigating the difference in the composition of different disease groups, as uh, we show here. So. Uh, some background about the airway. We see a large group here, the uh, green one, you can see it's the basal cell. So basal cells are actually stem cells in the airway. So in everybody's airway, there are a lot of basal cells and it constantly renews itself and differentiate into different functional types to make up the functions that's lost during the process like injury, or like uh, damage, short-term damage from pathogens, from chemicals. And that is this loop of healthy sinus and healthy, healthy nasal epithelium. The basal cell differentiate through EMT, and then it uh, changes into different functional types and replace the damaged cells, resulting in a healthy epithelium being uh, refreshed. So that is why people call it protectors of epithelial walls in health and uh, respiratory disease, like in the uh, Game of Thrones, protects uh, of, of blah, 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 blah. So in our study, we actually found this to be the largest group here. And uh, uh, since we know it differentiate into different functional types, one very interesting question would be, how is it developing into different types in our data set? So here we introduce the concept of trajectory inference from single cell data. It is a very advanced method, but it's also quite usually applied in the current studies. So there are different methods, as I list here, there are PAGA, slingshot, T-scan, all of those. But the concept is the same. They pick a cell, a starting cell. So since uh, we assume this is the a stem cell population, and they will differentiate into different types. So uh, based on the concept that we capture cells at uh, different stages of this evolution, we will be able to align them in a, in a pseudo time space that meaning we can uh, align them according to the gradual change in their gene expression and uh, simulate such path of their di differentiation. And along this path, we can then query what genes are upregulated or downregulated during the process. So that's the concept of trajectory inference. And we applied it to our data, picking basal cell as a starting point. So we identified three paths uh, from this uh, basal cell. The first path is to the goblet cells, as uh, shown here from the basal cell to goblet cell, the second path is to glandular cell here. The third path is to the ciliated cell, which are most uh, profound in the airway. And also there's another path to go into the secretory cell. And we can also identify the key gene change along this path, which are very uh, rich information we can acquire from single cell sequencing. So another thing is, since we know the basal cell can differentiate and we have established the path of them differentiating into different states. A natural thought would be, since we have different disease groups, how is this differentiation process impaired in the process of the disease? 
So that is how we can do it next. We can uh, plot the uh, amount of cells or the richness of these cells on different paths in different disease groups. And the, the results are quite shocking. So we found, uh, first of all, in the chronic uh, rhinosinusitis, more basal cells remain undifferentiated. So that means the basal cells just keep stay there. They don't differentiate into other cells to renew themselves. Yeah, so if everybody remember in this plot, we can actually see that uh, here, the cells are duplicating themselves, but they are not evolving into functional states to really replace and restore the healthy lining of the nasal, poly nasal mucosa. So uh, we dig further into these uh, data and we identified that in the non-eosinophilic CRS, the patients showed significant loss of secretory cells here. And uh, you can see here, this part is basically gray. So the cells differentiate into goblet cells, but they cannot replace the ciliated cells. They cannot replace glandular cells. They cannot replace, uh, most important of all, the secretory cells. Uh, whereas in the eosinophilic uh, CRS, the patients showed significantly reduced ciliated and uh, secretory cells. So we confirmed the barrier function is impaired and the differentiation the replacement of basal cells to other functional cells are kind, kind of stopped at the checkpoint. This is a very important finding in the first place. And another finding is we then dig into the T lymphocytes and the innate lymphoid cells, which of course are the reason of all the inflammation. And we classify them into 16 subtypes. Many of these subtypes are reported in uh, some uh, large-scale immunology uh, research or disease research nowadays using single-cell technology. But uh, in every data set, we can always find something interesting, something new, some new gene expression characteristics. So what we find here is the tissue resident memory, CD8 T cell, are enriched in healthy mucosa, dem uh, demonstrating they have a function to combat the constantly coming pathogens and the like uh, outside stimuli. But in the eosinophilic CIS, it has more naive CD4 T cells and regulatory T cells, which are the cells that regulate the CD8 T cell cytotox cytotoxicity and uh, keep them from killing pathogens. And the uh, eCRS also have significantly enrichment in Th2 cells and LC2, which if everybody remember, it's a known driver for type 2 immunity. It's also demonstrated here. If we plot the hallmark genes of the type 2 immunity, we can see it's very highly specifically ex expressed in Th2 and ILC2. This also confirms the high resolution and uh, a, a level of precise in our data. We then looked at the plasma cells because B cells are also a very important part of the immunity. And if you can see here, these uh, red one in the ECRS group have a lot of cells that are accumulated in this group. And we uh, then investigated their gene expression. Turns out they are expressing a lot of IgE, which are well-known uh, immunoglobulin for allergic reaction in asthma and the airway disease. And also IL-5 receptor alpha. IL-5 is a direct attractant of eosinophils, as demonstrated here. So ILC2 and uh, sometimes uh, some other uh, cells that will produce IL5 to attract the eosinophils, resulting in a local inflammation, eosinophilic inflammation. And the, the ILC2 and TH2 are among the most important cells that produce IL5 that uh, uh, fosters this eosinophilic inflammation environment. So all of these are very in line with our hypothesis and uh, uh, the previous findings by other research. We also find something new. So 
there's uh, all the myeloid cells, we divided them into 20 subsets, uh, including four dendritic cells, 11 macrophage subsets, three neutrophils, two mast cell subsets. And then we found these CDC2 that are characterized by high expression of ALOX15 is specifically enriched in EC areas. If, if you look at the box plot here, in all the three groups, HC, healthy control, CRS, and ECRS, they don't have so much cells, but in ECRS, there are a lot of uh, CDC2 expressing ALOX15. So this gene encoded uh, protein 15LO is an enzyme that generates various bioactive lipid mediators to regulate inflammation and immunity. And also previous immunology papers have confirmed their link to the type two immunity and can attenuate the development of Th17 cells. Uh, we also found uh, another macrophage uh, population. So uh, if we look at here, 15 and eight, the green one and the purple one, the namely the FN1 macrophage and the FCER2 macrophage, they are also selectively uh, higher in ECRS, and they also drive the type two immunity. So uh, they also have very strong molecular uh, signatures that are in line with previous uh, publications. So these are all findings on the single cell gene expression level. We then use the cell interaction analysis. So this is a analysis, basically we do it in computer space, we, we do it in silico. We use only the data, gene expression data from what's collected from the experiments, but we there's no need to really like culture the two cell types in the dish and uh, see if they interact with each, with each other. We can simulate all those interactions from thousands or tens of thousands of cells using the receptors and ligands they're expressing. So here, we actually can see uh, a lot of very important uh, interactions are elevated. So the concept of this analysis is if cell type A is e expressing a ligand and cell type B is expressing its counterpart receptor in a very high level, then we assume there's strong interaction between the two cell types and there's mathematical model involved, but uh, after uh, the these uh, high volume of, da of data, we will prioritize the cells that are more likely to be interacting. So we actually identified that here, the CDC2, the ALX15 CDC2, have a very high probability of interacting with the TH2 and ILC2 through the CCR4 axis. This confirms the microenvironment of uh, interaction. So finally, we seeked uh, validation through other technologies. So here, we validated the study uh, through uh, indi uh, independent cohort. So we collected three more healthy control, three more CRS, three more uh, individual from each group, and we collected the same sample. But this time, we used a different technology. We used CYTOF to validate the existence of those cells that are expressing the markers we identify from the gene expression data. And uh, all of these results are positive and the change in populations are also validated. And we also confirmed the expression using uh, immunofluorescence. These are all positive results, so which give us more confidence in the findings. And uh, then we used in vivo and the in vitro assay to really uh, validate the hypothesis we raised, that is the type two inflammation dominates the eosinophilic uh, CRS. And we we can uh, blockade or rescue this uh, phenomenon with ALOX15 blocking. So uh, these are results of the in vitro exper uh, experiments, but this is the uh, experiment in real uh, individual and in, in the real animal. So we used papain to induce the eosinophilic CRS. This is a, a very validated model. 
and we use a 15-LO inhibitor, which is the ALOX15 uh, enzyme inhibitor to rescue the phenotype. And in the end, the results are very good. The uh, eosinophilic CRS induced by papain in those mouse are really rescued by this treatment. So in summary, how did we design this study? We started from microenvironment landscape of nasal mucosa through single cell RNA sync. We collected healthy control to establish a baseline and to compare the disease uh, on top of those. And then we collected a very balanced design of different disease groups to get to know what are the significant change in the microenvironment. And then we identify the cell types that are unevenly distributed among those groups. So we found basal cell retention in the CRS. We found accumulated type two immunity sub subtypes in the eosinophilic CRS, including B cells, TH2, ILC2, CDC2. Furthermore, we from the cell subtypes, we found the molecular characteristics of those disease specific cell types, including the IgE, IL5, the ALX15 gene, and CDC2. So then we establish biologic uh, hypothesis from those findings. We establish the inflammation blocker of uh, basal cell to differentiate into functional types to renew the epithelium. We also hypothesize the type 2 immunity activity maintains this eosinophilic local inflammation. And we confirmed this hypothesis using our data from single cell rna seq alone by cell trajectory analysis to confirm the blockade of basal cell differentiation and using cell interaction analysis to confirm the local crosstalk in the microenvironment. And then to make it more solid, we use different technologies like CYTOF and IF to confirm the funding, the finding and accumulation of cell subtypes and the molecular subtype uh, molecular characteristics in the microenvironment. And we conducted mouse study to rescue the type two immune response in uh, induced by the molecular targets. And we can block those molecular targets to rescue this phenotype. And finally, we could draw a conclusion that is from nasal mucosa to normal nasal mucosa to this eosinophilic uh, chronic inflammation, we can depict the stromal and immune landscape, the changes during the disease progression. And we found the key drivers in this inflammation. And we found crucial molecules in the process of this disease progression. So to sum up, this is a very complete study. Well, not complete as we get to the very bottom of those cells and the rescuing those and get into a real therapeutic uh, solution. But uh, it's a, a story that's well told about the local information in the eosinophilic CRS. If going beyond, there are actually very good thoughts about it. So this is a, a cross-sectional study where we take different uh, uh, sections of uh, the healthy control and the disease individuals. But what if we do a longitudinal study uh, to get on the, on, in, from the angle of time, how did this normal environment shift its equilibrium to into a chronic inflammation status? And how are these cells, although we now know the functions of them, how are they spatially organized? And how, how are they like form local communities so sometimes the drug cannot get into it, or sometimes the symptom become very severe and we are it's hard to treat. So all of these are very useful thoughts as second step in this domain of research. There are also some other advanced techniques that we can apply to the cell dynamics and identity study. For example, I'm showing uh, some study that we can conduct on single cell level that's measuring single cell gene expression and chromatin accessibility to identify the regulators in embryo development. This is another case demonstrating the capability of single cell studies. And also we can use clonal tags to trace the cell development lineage. All of these are very possible under the context of single cell study. And also at Ava Sciences, we can do a lot more. For example, this is a demonstration of our in-house study to use 
single nuclear RNA seq and the Vizium uh, spatial transcriptomic analysis to identify cell types and their topological location in the mouse lung. So here are some demonstration of the single nuclear uh, data we collected and we compared it to published data. And we found our data can better represent some stromal cell types uh, in the mouse lung. For example, here it is uh, alveolar type one cell. And we can map different cells in the spatial setting. We can know what uh, cells are located where and what kind of other immune cells are located close to them or uh, stimulating some local changes or tissue remodeling. This is conducted in normal tissue, but we can apply it further in disease tissue. For example, in this case here, we can in situ identify the malignant cells in spatial transcriptomics data. So this is uh, breast cancer data, and we can actually identify the malignant cells, uh, their spatial location, and we know the existence of different immune cells in those regions and how they are interacting with each other. This is also, this is done on FFPE samples. So we can actually make use of those uh, old pathology samples and really turn them into a background or a platform of discoveries. So uh, all of these are just cases demonstrating we can enable discoveries at high resolution. So uh, we can provide uh, different uh, experiment technologies combined with our deep bioinformatic solutions and empower those fundamental and the clinical investigations. And we have also helped our customers publish a lot of high impact papers uh, with their studies. Finally, we are also going to AACR uh, a few days later. So if you, uh, you guys will also be at AACR, you're welcome to meet us at booth 3042 to discuss how we can help with your study and how we can help with the data at your hand that you find it hard or cumbersome to find any insight of. And uh, with that, I conclude the uh, presentation of this study. So I will hand this back to Vic. Chris, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Um, it was very informative. Uh, now we will have Q&A from the audience. Uh, we have uh, many questions posed to us. Um, so the first question is, um, thank you for the thorough introduction of, of the study. Uh, in the validation part, you used CYTOF to validate findings in single cell RNA-seq. What is the difference? And can I use CYTOF only to repeat similar investigations? Uh, yes. So this is a very good uh, question. If I go back to the CYTOF page, uh, we can actually see the visualization is very similar. The visualization is very similar to what we demonstrate in the single cell RNA data. But the difference of CYTOF is a CYTOF essentially it quantifies the uh, expression of proteins using antibodies. So it can profile uh, in most commercially available solutions, it can profile like up to 50 uh, antibodies in every cell. And the volume is quite high. You can get like uh, 20,000 uh, or sometimes close to a million cells profiled in one run for some machines. But the drawback is uh, the number of proteins that can be profiled is very limited. It's only 50. So it's better for validations. Uh, but as for discovery, so we, if we don't know what's the gene we're looking at, then uh, the single cell RNA-seq, which offers full transcriptome, will be most useful for us to find those genes, identify those genes, and then validate using CYTOF. And also, since it can only target proteins, if it's something that we want to identify, it's not protein, but it's gene expressed or sometimes RNA or other things, CYTOF cannot help in that setting. So that's uh, a main consideration in uh, CYTOF versus single cell RNA-seq. And the next question that we have is, what method was employed to collect cells, um, i.e brush biopsies or what other methods? Uh, yes, these uh, samples that we collect from uh, this study is from endoscopy. So 
uh, we will get like a very small chunk of tissue, like a, a similar to the size of a grain of rice. And that will be uh, enough for digesting the tissue into single cell and identify the different immune cells. The third question is how many samples are suitable for a single cell study? Uh, so since we're doing, these are real disease samples, uh, the background of those patients are quite different from a mouse study. For a mouse study, typically we will employ or recommend the rule of three. That is, we do three biological replicates, but for these uh, real human samples, uh, it is recommended to always try more than three in a group in case the background or the disease uh, is so different in different individuals that we cannot extract uh, a lot of things that are in common for every group. So in every group, as we designed this study, we aimed for five. And in the end, we uh, collected the five that's viable for each group. The next question is, what is the name of the analysis that allows to map cells, cell interaction via expression of ligands or receptors? Uh, yes. So there are many methods available right now uh, for such analysis. The one we showed here is called the cell phone DB. Uh, so later we can, we can supply you the paper of that uh, uh, method and also I would say there are like more than five, well, maybe if we count those published on uh, bioarchive, there will be more than 10 or 20 methods to simulate this cell to cell interaction and prioritize the important cell pairs that are interacting with each other. Okay, the next question is, what was the representation of disease versus control cells? Any comments on how properly represented disease cell number from your experiment, like high number of disease cells and low number of healthy cells or vice versa? Yeah, so here we used it, uh, an adjusted uh, uh, fraction of cell number in the analysis to profile the disease population versus the healthy presentation. But uh, uh, statistical wise, there are uh, quite a number of uh, methods to quantify the difference in cell populations. So uh, actually, uh, if you look at uh, the, uh, for example, go to PubMed and search uh, cell distribution in single cell, they have there have been uh, quite a number of statistical discussion and uh, published methods to quantify. For example, in some of our other studies, we use odds ratio to quantify the cells that should be there in under a completely random situation or the cells that are accumulated. And also there are uh, other methods, for example, chi-square test and uh, uh, also, we 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 uh, adapted chi-square test into another method called the ratio of observed uh, over expressed. This is also a, a method we used in a paper that we published on cell. So I will. So we have one last question. Um, I I do see a couple more questions, but um, the last question um, that. I'm going to propose to you is, uh, what are some challenges during the study? Oh, yes. So one challenge actually is the dissociation of cell. So we collected the nasal polyps from the samples. And at first, the recovery of live cells are very low. And uh, we had to use, since the human tissue are made up of different uh, stromal compositions, sometimes there are fibers, sometimes there are are some extracellular matrix, different collagens. We actually spend the first two months or three on optimizing the tissue digestion process. And uh, in the end, we custom made uh, a digestion process and the composition of enzymes for this uh, nasal tissue study. So uh, 
in the end, you can see the digestion results are actually very good since we can recover some rare cell types. And also we can uh, re recover the, for example, the neutrophils and different subtypes of neutrophils from this study. This is something that uh, typically people will complain it's hard to recover from single cell study, but uh, in the end, we uh, end up have very good results. So that is one thing I want to highlight uh, our service. That is, if you have challenging samples or if you want to test out very like previously not done or not commonly done by others, the uh, experiment procedures, uh, we can actually help you troubleshoot and uh, help you design new strategies or very challenging strategies to uh, get the insight out of, of your uh, pressure samples. Okay, so um, there are a few other questions. Um, w please uh, email to the emails that I've provided here in the chat, uh, which is support at abiosciences. If you have any more questions, please uh, um, propose your questions there and we will answer it. Um, Chris will personally answer those questions. Um, and also if you have any service inquiries, uh, please email sales at abiosense.com. Um, with that, thank you. Uh, thank you all for attending. Uh, we conclude this webinar. Thank you.